Welcome to Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Bubba, here we are, first time to do a Rick and Bubba University from the brand new studio. And let me tell you something, our first ever podcast in this new studio, not our first podcast, but just in the studio first podcast, is going to start with a bang. Rick, we are so excited to have somebody on the show today who is legendary to us growing up, being Atlanta Braves fans, struggling through the years when they were just horrible, to finally breaking that, getting to the World Series and being World Series champions, the one and only Sid Bream. Sid, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Rick and Bubba. It's great to be with you guys, man. Congratulations on the new studio, bud. Ah, 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 ah. There it is. See, we got the chop going. Sid, I I know, uh, you know, I know that you, when you got to Atlanta, that you had, you know, been with some other teams. Did you understand when you got to Atlanta what Atlanta fans had been through? I mean, did you have a concept of what it was like to have your little league team (laughs) leave on a Thursday and you didn't even call till Wednesday? And your little league team could sit behind home plate at a uh, at a Braves game. You might get to pitch a late inning. Yeah, and every one of us had our pitcher made with Daryl Chaney. Yeah. I mean, do you do you realize uh, what we, we we thought we could never ever see it? Now, Braves fans today are spoiled. They don't know what your team was able to do for all of us. They really don't. No, and 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 I guess Rick and Bubba, you guys are are older than twenty nine, going on thirty years old now. Because I mean. That's how long ago it was. I mean, when when uh, John Sherholtz and Bobby Cox and you know put together a great ball team back in the early 1990s, and and uh, I was just fortunate to be a part of that. But what I did know, what I did recognize, is I was coming from a, a winning team with Pittsburgh, and uh, making my way down to Atlanta that had the worst worst uh, season in baseball in 1990. That's what I did know. Sid, we would do – I was uh, – Bubba and I have been working in radio a long time, and we grew up – you know, I told you things about our Little League teams going over there. And, and then, of course, Dale Murphy came, and and, we, and he was – We got he, to see Hank Aaron play. They right. just didn't win a lot of games. Yeah, they didn't win a lot of games. And then Dale Murphy came, which means we would we would at least score one run. Uh, and, and, and so it was um, – we, we – we would we would be on the air, Sid, doing Braves games, and and the Braves would go to a commercial break, but sometimes it would they would just stop talking during the game, and you could hear the beer salesman in the background, <laughs> and you would think if they, you would think have they gone to the commercial break? Yeah, you'd panic. Yeah, and then also you'd hear ball inside, you know, and you're just like, and then now the announcers have stopped. They're, they're not doing color commentating anymore. What are they possibly going to say? So you, they have Rick, had well, a, you're 17 games out of first place. And it's like the first month. It's, right. it, it's not a lot to say, but, uh, but then that the, you, you came from Pittsburgh. So when you were going to Atlanta, were you, were you excited about it? Or were you like, what's happening to my career? What were you thinking? You know, that's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, I just know that, I mean, at that point in time, I mean, to give you a little history, I mean, Pittsburgh, after the 1990 season, after we lost to the Cincinnati Reds in the playoffs, the Pittsburgh management came out and said the very next day that we lost to Cincinnati that Sid Bream was their first priority to sign for the 1991 season. So I can tell you that my wife and I were ecstatic thinking, hey, you know, we're going to be in Pittsburgh. We're going to get a multi-year contract. Things are good. And uh, but, you know, to let you know that throughout negotiations, they didn't even get close. Uh, they didn't even get close to, uh, you know, ballpark uh, or market price with me. And uh, so it went to free agency. And then at that point in time, uh, Atlanta gave me a great offer, said, we want you to come down. And, and um, but even after all that, to make a long story short, guys, I mean, um, you know, the um, I went back to the Atlanta Bra- or Pittsburgh Pirates and asked them to, uh, you know, give me their best deal. And I, I asked them for a no trade deal. I was actually going to take the deal that they had for me if they would give me a no trade deal. And uh, they said no to a no trade deal. And I said, man, if I'm your first priority, I'd hate to see what your last one is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so at that point in time, my wife, my wife and I went to Atlanta knowing that they were the worst team in baseball in 1990, but also understanding that they had a great nucleus of young talent that was there. 
And uh, they were bringing in some great guys like Terry Pendleton and Charlie Lee Brandt and Raphael Belliard and a lot of other guys that to boost boost that uh, young talent. So we were we were hopeful, but we just didn't realize it was going to happen so quickly. Did did you did you have a sense not only with the players but John Sheerholtz? Did you could you sense that something management wise was going to happen too? That uh, or did you just go look best deal I got? Let's make the best of it. Well, I mean, I think that that was uh, not the best deal, but I mean, that was, they were the first ones that certainly came out. I mean, you know, again, as I shared with you, I wasn't concerned about the money. I was concerned about being on a winning team. And and uh, but whenever Pittsburgh didn't live up to their their uh, you're the you're my our first priority, then uh, my wife and I went the other route a little bit, and we thought about the funds, but. As I stated, I mean, we understood the people that they were bringing in, knowing that they were really doing a great job of filling a lot of holes to try to make that team a, a winner. So John Sherholtz, you know, and I, I'm sure it was because of Ted Turner giving me the OK, said, hey, let's uh, let's start building this team and making it a good one. And and uh, John Sherholtz did a great job of that. Well, there's so many parts of your career we want to break down, but I, I Rick, we, we can't get over the, the mainstay of, of the moment with oh, Sid Bream. 1992, the Braves have turned the corner. They're in the National League Championship Series. Game seven, Pittsburgh Pirates, your old team. And we need one run to go to the World Series. We get a hit, and here comes Sid Bream around third base. Sid, I'm going to be honest with you. You were a yeah. great player. Speed yeah. Merchant was not in your resume. Oh, I remember and thinking, Lord, <laughs> why does it have to be Sid? <laughs> we uh, were screaming, drop the trailer, drop just, the trailer. Just dive. Uh, You're really tall. Just jump. Sid, it seemed like it was a month from the time <laughs> you passed oh, shortstop okay. all the way to okay. home plate. I mean, for us watching it because – you know, it wasn't it wasn't okay. Sid Bream trying to score from second base. It was the hopes of a, of a nation that had been so, so much downtrodden pain. for, so much for pain. our lifetime. Could you feel our pain on your yeah. shoulders? I mean, I thought it was never going. And and when you cross that home plate, I, it, it's one of the happiest moments in my life. I'll be honest with take, you. Take us there, Sid. Did it seem well, that long yeah. for you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just uh, just recognize this, guys. I mean, I I. At one point in time, when I started the game of baseball, I ran pretty well for a big guy. I mean, yeah. I ran a six eight sixty. I had I had a record in Pittsburgh for the you know for first baseman for steals. Right. Uh, I I would go first to third with the best of them because I knew how to run bases. Uh, you know, so those things were very much. I I prided myself yeah. on that stuff. But at that point in time, I mean, that night and and again, we can. We can debate this, but I mean, Bobby Cox left me out there when he could have put a pitcher in. Yeah, that could have been could have been into the dugout by the time I got home. And uh, but uh, you know, I had had five knee surgeries on my right knee, one yeah. on my left. I had a big brace on, and I'll admit to you, I mean, it, it took me out of the game of baseball that I love to play. I mean, I was um, I was one of those individuals that loved to charge a pitcher when he was squaring around a bunt, and if he made any kind of a bad bunt. I had a double play. I mean, uh, I was I was one that loved to go first to third, and and uh, but when that's when when that last knee surgery took place, it just took me away from the kind of baseball that I love to play. Yeah. I mean, I had to really determine in myself what I needed to do before I got to a place, and and a lot of people on that play for that particular place sat there and always comment, "Man, what a great hook slide." I said, where was a hook slide? I mean, I went straight into the base. There was no hook slide in that thing. But, but I mean, as you guys were talking, I mean, you know, that that has been my my life. I mean, that has yeah. been my career, that particular play on October 14th of 1992, because sitting out on second base, I mean, there were two outs. Uh, you know, I was the winning run. Francisco Cabrera comes up to the plate and, and I tell people, I mean, you guys are making fun of my speed, but I tell people, I mean, as I came around third, I looked out to Barry Bonds and saw that it wasn't going to be close. So I shifted down just a little bit, just so that I could make it close and, and uh, take us to the World Series. <laughs> see, I, I, I think, see, I think you're, you're looking at it wrong. We're not making fun of your speed as much as it, I, I think because of the – 
place we were in the space-time continuum, it seemed like a long time. Did it seem that way to you? Or When that ball was hit, were you going home? Uh, what were your thoughts at third base? I was – I mean, there was a lot of individuals, I mean, said – I mean, shoot, Jimmy, Jimmy Williams was stopping you. I don't know. I mean, I don't know to this day. I mean, you were always <laughs> taught to put the pressure on the defense. I mean, I, I've never, ever seen a video – uh, of Jimmy Williams along with myself in any video to let me know if he was stopping me or he was making me go. But you're always taught you uh, you put the pressure on the defense. I mean, yep. for somebody else to come up and get a base hit to, to win that ball game would have been very, very difficult against their closer. And uh, so right from the get-go, I had the best scenario possible. I had two outs. I knew that they weren't going to try to pick me off. And at the crack of the bat, I was off. And, and uh, even with all that, I beat it by about four inches. Yeah, it was a thrilling, uh, thrilling, thrilling moment. Yeah, it was. And, uh, and, of course, as you said, all, all, all you had already done before that, immediately everything shifts to Sid Bream with the winning run for Atlanta and, and uh, ending, uh, uh, you know, so much heartache for Atlanta fans. We'll come back. we got Sid Bream with us. There's so much we can talk about in today's edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. All right, so, you know, Sid was talking about, um, you know, being out there in that moment. And, and let me tell you this. Uh, uh, men, uh, you know, when we're, we're – we don't talk about underwear a lot, and, I, and it's a weird transition to talk about underwear. But when it comes to Tommy John, I think we need to. And we're not talking about the surgery. We're talking about the underwear, uh, because I mean, if you if you are you know thinking to yourself, you know, hey, it doesn't really matter. Why don't you take the challenge? Why don't you get Tommy John underwear? And they are so much more comfortable. And and when you're comfortable and and underwear fits the way it's supposed to on a man, everything that you do, you can do better. Now, ladies, they have stuff for you too. But but right now I'm I'm strictly talking about Tommy John men's underwear. They're breathable. They're lightweight. Uh, the moisture wicking fabric, uh, four times the stretch of competing brands. So they they they've sold over 17 million pairs. But they also have loungewear that is that looks great and it's comfortable, uh, and you can wear them anywhere. Uh, so uh, if you right now would like to take the challenge. Uh, get 20% off your first order when you go to TommyJohn.com slash Rick Bubba. That's TommyJohn.com slash Rick Bubba for 20% off. And I'm telling you, from our experience, these will be the best pair you ever wear or they're free. And we can tell you, you're not going to be giving them back. You are going to love them. So go now, TommyJohn.com slash Rick Bubba. Sid Bream, our guest today on Rick and Bubba University, the podcast, and um, so yeah, you know, <laughs> Rick and I. Oh, yeah, I want to say yeah, something to yeah. Sid. I, during the break, I went and looked at the video again of that play. Okay, Sid, you were digging. Yes, you because were. that ball was not hit near as deep as I remembered it being. That was a that was a hard play to score on if you were a speed merchant. So again, congratulations. I guess to us watching it because we'd had so many heartbreaks with the Braves. It just seemed like it took forever. It was like it stood still. Yeah, you know what you need to it say? It was like the Matrix. Let me tell you and, what you I'm... Know, and I, I was watching you run, and I, 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 it seemed like I was just hung and suspended. I'm going to go and stand up for big men everywhere. Sid Bream, you saw it. It wasn't hit that deep, and he made it home. So who says he's slow? He made it. So if you made it, you had to be pretty quick, even with the knee hobbling along. Mm-hmm. Guys, I mean, you know, I don't know if you know all the story about that, but Andy Van Slyke, Barry Bonds was actually playing real close to the warning track. Um, and Barry, Andy Van Slyke, the center fielder for the Pittsburgh Pirates, the story goes that he told Andy uh, Barry to move in. And Barry gave him the uh, Hawaiian peace single, signal. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and so Barry stayed where he was, but and but at the same time, then Andy also stated that if he would have moved in, who knows what would have happened? Because I mean, the angle that he had to get to that ball might have taken you know taken him just a little bit more to get rid of it to right himself to throw that baseball uh, to get home. So who knows what took place? I just know that that God had me there for a purpose, not only for the Atlanta Braves fans, but for a lot of individuals to. Uh, uh, you know, he gave me a platform because of that. It's Amen. been wonderful. Yeah. But let me just say this to you guys. You'll never, in the game of baseball, you'll never, ever have another 
play like that, other, you know, other than a home run, but you'll never, ever have a close play like that again, be able to be impromptu because, uh, you know, right away, if it was today, Jim Leland would have thrown out the uh, replay flag and everybody would have had to sit in suspense for five minutes, 10 minutes, <laughs> right. whatever, while they looked at that play and then come up and said safe. And see, I, I live in Pittsburgh and I still have people that come up and tell me I was out. So, uh, <laughs> so. Sid, let me ask you this, because the, the Braves had become bigger than life heroes in Atlanta during that time, during the turnaround. And just to be in that position in the NCL, uh, NLCS was pretty impressive. But you were an absolute hero after that. How, how was that being Sid Bream in Atlanta in 1992? Um, man, I mean, it was, it was, it was crazy. My, my family, um, and it, and it wasn't just myself, but I mean, all the Braves, I mean, we, we tell the stories and actually coming up here, you know, uh, this next week, guys, I mean, I'm going to be down with the Braves fantasy camp down in, down in Sarasota there where they have their, their, uh, spring training. Oh, that's and awesome. uh, I'm going to be able to get with a lot of my guys. I mean, Steve, <laughs> Harry Pendleton, Charlie Lee Brandt. A lot of a lot of guys that I played with and, and have, have watched guys go out there and uh, make fools of themselves, thinking that they could play the game of baseball. But uh, <laughs> well, it uh, you know, and, and I'm looking at the comments on YouTube because I I, I echo them and and we lived them. People are calling it the greatest play in baseball history. The chills that they get, even when they go back and look at it today, and I felt the same way a minute ago when I looked at it. It, it was just awesome, awesome time. Was it was it sweet because it was against Pittsburgh? Not that you would hold a grudge, but I mean, <laughs> did, did did that feel pretty good? Well, you know, and let me let me sh share this with you. Nineteen ninety one, when I because I loved the ball players. I mean, I loved everything about Jim Leland, my my team that I played with in Pittsburgh, and in the nineteen ninety one, I hit my first grand slam of my major league baseball career against Pittsburgh. And uh, if you were to watch, if you were to had a camera pan on me, and they did, it would it was like my my mother just died. Mm. I mean, uh, you know, I, I really truly felt for them. And in 1991, when we knocked them out of the World Series in 1991, I mean, I I really had a hard time with the fact that these guys have been working so hard to get to the World Series. Now, I'm not saying that I was going to do anything to you know <laughs> take that take that away from Atlanta, but I I really hurt for them that they weren't getting to the world series. And, but, but 1992, I mean, a lot of those things had changed and I was just thankful to be a part of the Atlanta Braves and, and uh, you know, whether or not I was, I was tickled pink that I knocked them out of it again, maybe for management's sake, I was, Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but for the player's sake, I mean, I don't think that I had that attitude, but for management, I was probably saying, Hey, deserves your right. Well, I want to, I want to, yeah, because it's too different. I want to ask, I want to get into the world because so few of us and people get the chance to play, you know, their sport at the highest level. I mean, you realize that. I mean, it's, it's such a, a small percentage. And what Very a, thankful. yeah, what a blessing that God would allow that. So certainly your talent was God given, but, but, you know, there's many who have talent that, um, that never can put it uh, quite in the right um, place or, you know, things just don't happen the way you thought. So we all sit here and go, we're fans. We have our team colors on. You left another team. You're our guy now. And fans switch relatively quick. I mean, just honestly, I know it's a business. You're from, you're from Pennsylvania. You're, you're living there now. This is your home state. This is Pittsburgh. You go to Atlanta. Uh, and, uh, and I know you were in L.A. before Pittsburgh. But, I mean, you, you, you spent time at Pittsburgh. Do these transitions for players? I know you're pros. I got that. But are these transitions as quick? I mean, do you do you say, man, I have been giving my all for this uniform, and now I've got another uniform on, and a whole group of players? How quick do you transition to, hey, this is my team? Other than just being a pro. I mean, I I, I think I mean it happens pretty doggone quickly. I mean, I, um, you know, when I got to Atlanta, you know, Bobby Cox sat Terry Pendleton and myself down and just told us, hey, we're we're looking to you guys for leadership and. So right from the get-go in spring training, Terry Pendleton were, and I were, uh, you know, just debating and talking to ourselves, saying, hey, what can we do in order to get these guys to understand what winning's all about? 
And uh, so, you know, it, it happened, you know, I, and I, I think for us, I mean, it was one of those things that, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, ex expectations were put on top of us uh, to be able to come down there and teach those young guys how to play. And, and so it put an another level of uh, uniqueness to it all. Uh, but, uh, but most guys, I mean, it's, it's, you're ready to go, but, but let me just, let me just go back and share with you. I mean, this is another memory for me that, that, uh, my wife and I just, uh, we, we suck it up when we think about it. But when I went back to Pittsburgh for the very first time in 1991, after all this, and, and the people knew the struggle that took place, but in 1991, when we went back, I didn't start the game because John Smiley, a left-hander was pitching and. And we actually got killed that game. Uh, we, we were losing nine to one going into the last inning. And uh, Jim Leland put in Stan Belinda once again uh, to pitch the ninth inning. And, and Bobby Cox uh, went ahead and put me on the on deck circle. And as the announcer announced me to, to go up to the plate, uh, the people in the stadium gave me a five minute standing ovation. Oh, wow. So that meant a lot. So my eyes were watering, my knees were knocking. Uh, no business being in the batter's box because I mean, if your functions aren't there, you just sit, sit and say, "Man, what am I doing here?" But uh, somehow, some way, Stan Belinda threw a pitch, and like I said, my my eyes were watering, my knees were knocking, and I swung the bat, hit the ball over the center field wall, uh, and <laughs> wow. ran ran around the bases and came in and stepped on home plate and the people gave me another five minutes standing ovation and, and uh, you know, it really meant a lot to my, myself and my family that uh, we gave it everything we had and the people appreciated that. Now they clearly saw it by that response. They, they, they clearly saw it. So um, you, um, you obviously um, got, got to play in the league, but is this something we almost start with, you know, the thing we remember and then go back. Is this something that you dreamed of? I mean, did, did you play a lot of other sports, or was baseball always, always what drew you to it? You know, a lot of times professional athletes, when they were, you know, playing as a young guy or in high school, played multiple things. Did, did how did this take place for you as far as being young and dreaming of of getting to the the, the highest level? I was uh, I was actually a pretty good basketball player too. I actually had more offers out of high school for basketball than I did baseball for college. Um, and, um, but baseball was my love, but in all reality, I can tell you that it wasn't until my senior year that I, I even thought about going any place to play professionally or college wise. Uh, but it wasn't until a, a professional scout, a Dodger scout came up to me and told me, Hey, you have a chance to be drafted in college in, in, in your senior year that I even started to think about it. I just love playing the game of baseball and. Uh, obviously that didn't happen. I did have three teams free agent wise after I signed to go to Liberty university in Virginia. I had three teams, uh, like I said, that, that came to me and asked me to come play. And I, I refused. And that was the best thing that I could have ever done because if, you know, if a young guy like myself being out in this world, who knows what would have happened. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, it was, that's where my love, or my thoughts started to happen as far as professional baseball is concerned, and uh, but not before that. We'll come back. We'll talk more with Sid Bream uh, and uh, and the in his personal life, and and of course uh, we've had fun talking about some of the great memories uh, of even Bubba and I watching him play as Atlanta Braves fans. Uh, but more with Sid Bream when Rick and Bubba University the podcast continues. All right, so um, when you're thinking about life insurance, Bubba, you and I had this conversation just the other day. Boy, um, we did, didn't we? And, and really, even at our age, you know, a lot of times you'll go out and you'll get some life insurance when you're younger, and then as you get older, you're going, look, can I just get something, just get this done? I need some term life insurance. If, if, you know, if, if I die before, you know, my wife or if you still have children in the home, whatever the case may be, what are they going to get? Well, that's why you need ladder. Ladder, L-A-D-D-E-R. Uh, look, Ladder is 100% digital. There's no doctors. There's no needles. There's no paperwork if you apply for $3 million in coverage or less. All you need is just a few minutes uh, and a phone or a laptop to apply. Ladder's smart algorithms work in real time. Uh, so you'll find out instantly if you're approved. 
Now, if you want to talk to a person, their team of licensed agents, uh, uh, they don't work on commission, so they'll help you. They're not trying to upsell you or try to get you some whole life plan or anything like that. There's no hidden fees. You can cancel any time you want. Uh, get a full refund if you change your mind in the first 30 days. So in 30 days, uh, if you're inside that and you go, I don't know, well, they'll give you a full refund. So uh, ladder policies are issued by insurers with long proven histories of paying claims. So you're not dealing with some run of the mill. You're dealing with the best of the best. They're A plus, uh, you know, uh, by um, AM best. Uh, finally, the life insurance costs more as you age. So well, you and I. Cross this off the list. Get it done. <laughs> yeah, we've so, learned that. Yeah, we? we've learned that. Uh, ladderlife.com slash Rick Bubba. Uh, see right now if you can be instantly approved. That's L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash Rick Bubba. Ladderlife.com slash Rick Bubba. Back on Rick and Bubba University, Sid Bream uh, is our guest, and uh, we've talked uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know baseball. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, these this historic moment, a couple of historic moments. Uh, in the baseball career of Sid Bream, but but you know I know now Sid that um, you uh, you are an avid outdoorsman, which by the way uh, you have friends here. Uh, we also are avid outdoorsmen. What do you like to do outdoor the best? Do you do you hunt? Do you fish? Do you do you hike? Uh, hey Rick, I do it all. Climb trees. Yeah. Well, what's your favorite? I'm a I'm an avid bow hunter. I mean I basically uh, will hunt whitetails, mule deer, elk. I've been to Africa a couple of times with my bow. And uh, I enjoy, I mean, not that I haven't taken early on. Uh, I took a gun with me when I went to the Yukon and some other places. But uh, as of today, I mean, I'm all I do is bow hunt, love the outdoors, um, love God's creation, and uh, love to be a part of it. So it's neat to hear that you guys are a part of that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just oh, yeah. uh, we, we, we appreciate just going out there and relaxing. There's something about it. Uh, that does more than any blood pressure pill will do for you. That's for sure. Tell us a little bit about bow hunting. Uh, what, what kind of bow do you use? And uh, tell, talk a little bit about that. I am, uh, I've been a Hoyt guy for a long time. I've, and right now I just bought the new Hoyt RX-5, the Ultra, and uh, shoot full metal, Easton full metal jacket arrows out of it. But uh, let me just tell you guys, I mean, you talk about being relaxing. This year in Kansas, I mean, uh, it was it was nothing about being relaxed. I mean, I had uh, sat for a whole week, what you know, seeing deer on my cameras, uh, seeing some big bucks on my cameras, but nothing was happening. Uh, the Saturday morning, the day that we were leaving, I look across a field and here comes a 160, 170 class whitetail come on, chasing the doe that's going to come right between me, uh, right, right by me. And uh, and at that point in time, guys, I mean, something that's never, ever happened in, in my whole time of bow hunting, when I stuck my hand in to get pull my bow off the bow holder, uh, somehow my thumb got attached to the the drop away rest cord. No. And so, and so as I started to pull the bow back, that, that cord wrapped around my finger. No. And, uh, you know, I knew what it was right away. I, I put it down, kept keeping my eye on the deer, thought I got it out, started to pull again and it was still attached. And by the time that I looked down and got it out, the deer had passed through my shooting lane and I was not a happy camper. I just want you to know that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's I'm, one of those non-relaxing moments we just talked about. Uh, Sid, what, what kind of range, what are you comfortable with? What uh, are you good with as far as uh, making a shot? Well, I, I would never, ever make a shot on a whitetail past 40 yards. But, I mean, I, I have been shooting. I'll get in a pie plate up to 100 yards. Oh, um, you know, so if I would be shooting at an elk or a moose or something and I had a clear shot, that they're not going to react as hard. I would, I would definitely take a shot at an elk between ninety to one hundred yards. But my real effective range is probably within six, sixty to, you know, to point blank. Do you, uh, do you have competitions with your friends like we do? We, when the bow season starts here, we like to have something called the Bow Olympics, and we challenge ourselves on ridiculous shots like what you're talking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My, uh, I didn't, I wasn't able to go to it last year, but my son has signed us up again this year. I was supposed to go and, and then something came up that I wasn't able to go, but, uh, 
it's some kind of a men of I don't know what it's called. I can't remember what it's called, but there's literally, uh, you know, they have shots out there like 105 yards. And uh, my, my son came out of there losing about six or seven arrows. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to be going to that this next year. But at the same time, when my family, my family is uh, big bow hunters. We always get together every fall and do a lot of bow hunting together. But when, but when we get together during the summer, everybody brings their bows and, We'll put balloons out there and have a competition to, to uh, whoever bursts the ball, uh, b- balloon quick, the quickest, he gets to pour a cold water over the person's mm-hmm. head and, oh, you know, or whatever. <laughs> so uh, we enjoy doing that kind of competition. And, and uh, my son, my son has started to overtake me. I used to be the best, but my son has started to uh, whoop my butt now. So I'm getting a lot of cold water on my back. Yeah, so you have what four children? Is that right? Four and uh, four children exactly. Yeah. Two, two, three great. Da- I just had a new daughter-in-law come into the family on November sixth. Congratulations! So three great daughter-in-laws, and then uh, I have two grandchildren. I mean, at four and four and two. So did did you have a hard time uh, as a dad with with sons? Did they any, did they participate in sports or uh, did you have to go through that routine? I had uh, all three of my sons played, you know, sports, basketball, baseball, for the most part. Uh, my second son, he went to college, and my third son went to college on a baseball scholarship at Liberty University. My second son got signed by the Arizona Diamondbacks as a third baseman and, uh, you know, played us several years before they released him. But, uh, you know, I had I had some good talent, but what, I, what I've always shared with people is I, if I if I got the instincts from my first son, the power and the arm from my third second son, and the athletic ability from my third son, and put them all together, I would have had a franchise player. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so did did you ever um, it, like when you start out with your with your oldest son? Because I have um, uh, four sons uh, as well and a daughter. But uh, my my oldest son came back one time to see me helping out with one of the teams of one of his younger brothers. And he walked out and he watched the game, and the game was over. And he said, excuse me, sir, I'm looking for my father. I did not see him during this game. Have you seen him? And I'm like, what, and I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, who is this guy out here? And I said, oh, man, I'm sorry. You were my first one. I didn't know what I was doing. I said, I, I've learned to put this in the proper place. Now he's looking at his brothers going, you don't really, who is this guy? Did you kind of learn through the sons to kind of, uh, as you went along, you, the third ones and that they, they, they really benefit from everything you learn with the others. Well, I, I mean, each, each of my kids, obviously I had an opportunity to coach, uh, my oldest one, I will say this to you. I mean, he, he came to me one day and said, dad, he said, I'll listen to you in baseball because you've been there, but but uh, don't try to tell me anything about basketball. And I mean, I just, <laughs> <laughs> so, don't tell me anything about basketball. Uh, all right. We come back. I want to talk about uh, another part of this because um, obviously uh, you're a man of faith and, uh, and I, I know you're going to be speaking at, at even an event in one of our, our markets and with, with some of the guys from the, from the show. And, um, so I want to talk about that when we come back. Now, before I come back and talk about that, I want to ask this question. Let's go back to the 160 class buck that you didn't get because you got your thumb wound up in your your bow. You know, we all have tests in life, Sid, uh, that God allows. Uh, did you pass the test when you when with your disappointment when that deer went by? I would say, you know, the Bible says to be angry and sin not. I can say this. I was angry, but I did not sin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, yeah, I understand exactly what you're talking about. And and being avid deer hunters, uh, I've got one I let walk the other day for no other reason than I just was indecisive, and I've dreamed about him several times. I keep seeing him walking through. I think you just block. want to go to dinner. Yeah, I, I was just yeah. like, what am I? If I become that guy now that if I shoot a deer, I think I'm going to mess dinner up? Yeah. Uh, but anyway. I, I, let me ask you this. How do you dream about a deer and then don't shoot him when he hit, gives you the opportunity? I, I, that's, uh, he's dreamed after, I after think. It was he's, all had, over. he's had like shooters, non-shooters Sh- regret. Yeah, non, oh, non-shooters yeah. regret. Yeah. My, my, one of my sons even said to me, Dad said, I talk, walk, walk with me through this why do we buy 
the feed? Why do we plant the food food plots? Why do we have all these cameras? Why do we have all this gear? Right. Wasn't that moment why we do all that? And I was like, it, it is, but it's beyond that, son. It's some you, You'll learn when you get older. There was a side of me that said, man, that's a good deer, but if he goes down, I kind of know what all that means. And, man, we got some good food back at the camp house. Yeah, I can smell it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so, all right, we'll come back. More with Sid Bream when Rick and Bubba University, the podcast, continues. All right, so I know the, these uh, decisions we have to make with the products that we use. Uh, how many times, Bubba, have you said, I don't really like the way this company behaves. I don't like the things they stand for. But what am I supposed to do? Yeah, where do I go? Yeah, what do I do? Well, uh, when it comes to your cell service, you you have options, uh, and and here's one that you may like better: Patriot Mobile. A, a lot of people talk about New Year's Eve resolutions and all this stuff, and we rarely stick to them. But what if you would like to resolve to do something uh, that you could actually, you know, say I'm not going to keep sending money to this company, acting like I don't have choices when it comes to my cell service. Uh, partner with Patriot Mobile, America's only Christian conservative cell phone provider. Uh, and, uh, and look, they offer broad nationwide coverage. In fact, they use the same towers as the major carriers. Uh, and you get the same great nationwide coverage, plus the peace of mind that your money isn't supporting things that you principally or morally or both uh, don't want to be supporting. Uh, Patriot Mobile has plans to fit any budget and – Their 100% U.S.-based customer support team provides exceptional customer support. More importantly, Patriot Mobile shares your values and supports uh, organizations that that fight for religious freedom, constitutional rights, sanctity of life. Uh, They're they're there for our veterans, our first responders. They're treated like the heroes they should be. So go to patriotmobile.com slash rickbubba or call 972-PATRIOT. You do have a choice. Get free activation with the offer code RICKBUBBA. Just put our names together, RICKBUBBA. Back to veterans. Veterans and first responders, we're going to save you even more money if you switch today. Support a company that, that loves America, loves you, and, and, and believes in the same things that you believe in. You don't have to compromise your principles just to have great cell service. So uh, do that now. Contact them, patriotmobile.com slash rickbubba, or call 972-PATRIOT and mention the code RICKBUBBA. This is the Rick and Bubba Show. Watch more at blazetv.com slash Rick and Bubba. Rick and Bubba, Rick and Bubba. Sid Bream is our guest. Uh, and uh, Sid, I mentioned uh, going to uh, to the uh, commercial uh, that you do a lot of speaking. Uh, you, uh, you are a follower of Christ and a man of faith. And there's an opportunity called Men of Iron that's going to be coming up uh, on February the 18th. Uh, and as a matter of fact, some of the guys from the show – uh, Helmsy and, and Lance Ingram are going to be with you, along with Tyler Stovall, who's also from Alabama and the Braves organization. And uh, you guys are going to be speaking at this uh, men's conference or men's gathering. Is, is this something you do a lot of, Sid? I mean, it, it has been. I mean, uh, I have uh, generally will get out between 20 to 35 times in a, in a year uh, to, to speak. And, and again, guys, it all goes back to 1992. I mean, as I've shared uh, so many times, I mean, without without 1992 and the platform that that has given me, uh, I would be like a lot of like most ball players that become obsolete. Uh, only their friends and their family remember that they played professional baseball. And and but God gave me a, an awesome gift in, in the opportunity to be a part of that slide and. Because of that, I'm trying to be faithful and, and go out and tell people about my love for Jesus Christ. And and uh, and as you guys have stated, I mean that you know the uh, the website to go to is Men of Fire, excuse me, Men of Iron Conference dot com, and uh, you can do that. It's a Cross Creek Community Church starting at six thirty on Friday night, and uh, I hope that a lot of you guys will sign up and come. I'd I'd love to be able to meet you and. And uh, but uh, at the same time, you'll hear a lot about, you know, my faith and, and uh, what that's all about, along with some baseball stories. And uh, but, uh, you know, just understand this. One of the biggest things that I'm struggling with today is one out of three kids, one out of three kids in our country don't have a dad in their home. Mm. I mean, that is that, you know, and you wonder why our, our country is the way it is right now or if I mean. You know, Satan right now is just, he's, he's just uh, hammering our families. 
And, uh, you know, and so I'm, I'm very passionate about that. I'll be speaking a little bit about that as well that night. But uh, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share that. And let me just do this real quick. I got a friend up here in, in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a friend of mine. His name is Ryan Stroop. He loves you guys. He watches you all the time. Can I just give him a shout out? Of just course. Ryan, absolutely. Absolutely. What's up, Stroop? <laughs> Ryan Stroop will love that. And, and uh, you know, good young man. And, and uh, he said he loves listening to you guys. So I, I didn't think that you would mind that. No, we, we appreciate Ryan listening. And, and uh, you know, people are starting to find this show all over the country with all the new technology. You know, we have a radio network, but now through the streaming and this and these podcasts, and you really can start having folks that find it everywhere, including right there where you're from. And um, so that that's a big honor. It really is. What, where, well, how are we on time there, Rick? Yeah, we got, I can't see the time. About five right minutes. Here. Okay. See, tell us a little bit about, uh, since you are a believer, uh, about when you became yeah. a believer and, and how all that came about in your life. Well, I, I'm, I'll, I'll just tell you guys. I mean, I, I was fortunate and thankful. I mean, I didn't I didn't realize it back then, but I was fortunate and thankful that I had a mom and dad that uh, loved me enough to take me to church. Uh, and uh, you know, again, I can remember rebelling quite a bit. Why in the world do I got to go to church? But uh, I soon realized how fortunate I was to have a mom and dad that loved me that was willing to tell me, take me to church, and let me hear about. A, a Jesus that loved me. And so at 13 years old at a revival meeting at our, at our church, uh, I went forward and gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And, and uh, I wish that I could say Rick and Bubba that, uh, man, my life, I mean, has just been on an upward trend, but you know, I went through some stupid stuff, uh, things that I did that, uh, were not honoring to him. And, uh, but I'm thankful that, uh, as he says, he chastens those he loves. Yeah, that uh, he he has continued to chasten me and then has been bringing me closer and closer to uh, you know himself and and uh, you know the blessing that it is every day to wake up and know that I'm serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords yeah. means the world to me and I I want to thank you guys for uh, standing up for your faith as well and and uh, you know having having that being something that's very very important to you. Well, it does, and, and I'm glad that you're, you know, certainly all of it matters, but you, you hit on it, and we've tried to kind of, you know, focus on if you can reach and disciple men, and, and see, there you were fortunate enough to have that family unit in your home, it solves a lot of problems. As, as you mentioned, Satan has gone after the family unit, and he's gone after men because of the influence that, that God gave uh, the the husband and the father and, and the men men and women are equal but they're they're distinct and and they're and they're and they're different one does not replace the other both equally important but there's an influence that God gave a man that Satan has apparently been fully aware of and has destroyed everywhere you go when you see this chaos you find the men have abandoned their families abandoned their children abandoned their wives abandoned their responsibilities so we just being common sense guys, we were thinking, well, then men's ministry should really be the number one priority because if you can go and, and get that man under the authority of Christ, then you fix a lot of problems. So we, we concentrate a lot there, and as you mentioned, God allowed you to have this platform because whether we like it or not, I tell people all the time, let's do men's ministry the way men actually are, not the way you wish they were. Yeah. And, and <laughs> how about this? Sometimes men will come here, Sid Bream, talk about Christ that wouldn't come here, you know, somebody that they had never heard of. Uh, and so baseball was given to you for this. Absolutely. I mean, you know, and again, I mean, that's, that's the uniqueness of Christ. He uses everybody. I mean, and you don't have to be a baseball player. You can, you can be a big influence to your neighbor uh, just by living your, living your faith out to your neighbor. But, you know, again, going back to the family, 85% of, 85% of kids that don't have a dad in their home are in, are, or 85% of uh, young people that are in jail come from fatherless yeah, homes. Yeah. If you start looking, yeah. yeah, that's a statistic you just cannot ignore. And you look at all the other things that the, 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 that this has produced like that, it it's mind boggling. So it, it's good to spend time in an area that's going to have a lot of impact. Uh, Sid, that means so much that you took time to be with us. Uh, again, all, I know Sid mentioned uh, the the website, but really on the Men of Iron, if you just go to rickandbubba.com, too, if you if you didn't remember the website, you can actually go right there to February 18th and 19th, and you'll see Men of Iron. 
Uh, you can go hear Sid uh, speak along with Helmsy and, and along with Lance Ingram and, uh, and also Tyler Stovall uh, on uh, 18th and 19th of February. Uh, and we hope that you'll do that. Sid Bream, thank you for being with us. You're such a class act, yeah. Sid. Such a pleasure to meet you. Well, Rick and Bubba, again, congratulations on uh, your new studio. And and uh, thank you for what you do. Thank you for, you know, like I said, being being men of faith and, and uh, being men of character. And uh, I just wish you the very, very best. And one of these days, if I don't see you down here, I'll see you in heaven, okay? All right, sounds right. good. Looks like we're stuck uh, with each other for eternity. That's right. And uh, hey, on that call, we're all going to be safe. <laughs> <laughs> that's so bad all right Sid thanks a lot buddy uh, Take it, care, guys. Uh, you too and thanks to all of you for joining us uh, for joining us on this edition of Rick and Bobby University the podcast